So, what are the mediators of inflammation in the brain? The answer is relatively straightforward. When I wrote my book, the entire focus was on microglia because that's frankly as far as we really had at the time. We now have a lot more information and there's a couple of more players we have to pay attention to. Astrocytes and mast cells. So it's now important that we take a look at what's going on with these three types of cells so that we can understand how to go about treating the problems that, we're suffer that people are struggling with with neuroinflammatory disease. Is this everything? Nope, we got more data coming. But at the moment, it's the clearest data we have available to us. So if we look at the microglia, so glial cells at one point we thought were just the skeletal structure of the brain. Well, it turns out that glial cells actually are 80% of the cerebral cortex, that area we do are all our big thinking, okay, and only 20% are neurons. So glial ends up turning, turning out to play a huge role in terms of the way the brain works, functions, and in fact is the other half of the brain. So oligodendrocytes are the things responsible for making the myelin sheaths around the nerves. The astrocytes will go into a great deal. Microglia, which constitute the innate immune system of the central nervous system, comprise about 6.5% of the, of the cells in the brain. So the smallest percentage, the 6.5%, the other is we don't need to be concerned with. But these are the guys that really are the heart of the innate immune system in the central nervous system. And this is a picture of a microglia. So microglia are the resident cells of the brain. So they live in the brain. They're there. They end up moving there uh, during the development of the fetus. They come from bone marrow. And they're absolutely crucial in the early development of the brain because the brain, there's huge amounts of turnover and creation of neuronal circuitry uh, as the fetus grows and as the brain grows. And the end result of which is you can get lots of neurotangles, you can get all these lovely neuronal highways that gets completely screwed up unless somebody's in charge of making sure that they stay straight and true. Microglia do that. So in the fetus, the job of the microglia is to make sure that the neurotangles don't occur and that there's lots of straight open highways for the nerves to function the way they're supposed to. They are the electricians of the CNS. They're constantly helping repair damage to uh, the neurons, all right? And they're the innate immune system of the central nervous system. The innate immune system's job is to respond instantaneously to a problem, and it responds stereotypically, meaning that it's always kind of the same response over and over again. The acquired immune system is about antibodies. It's about having learned that there's what this antigen is that's come into the system, and then making specific uh, chemicals that will attack it and protect the body against it. So the innate immune system just kind of does, you hit it, does the same thing over. All right, so this maintains the circuitry of the CNS. There is no resting state for microglia. It's a sessile state. They are constantly monitoring the environment. And they're constantly looking for problems that they need to go address. They can potentially influence, and they not potentially, but in fact, they do influence information processing in the central nervous system either indirectly via their actions with astrocytes or directly by their actions on the synapses. So they play a huge role in regulation of functioning of the nervous system. They also are not attached to anything in the brain, which is unique of all the other cell structures, meaning that astrocytes are attached to neurons and to blood vessels, uh, oligodendrocytes are attached to neurons, but microglia are actually between the tissues, between the neurons, and so that allows them to move in an amoebic-like fashion to whatever the area of damage is. And they go through a process called microgliosis. And microgliosis goes from the sessile state, where they're just checking the environment to see what's going on, to an activated state, which is an inflammatory state where they're spewing out a lot of different inflammatory factors. And then they can move all the way to a macrophage state if they need to, in terms of uh, actually uh, destroying bacteria or viruses. Most of the time, they'll go into this activated state and then go back down in the sessile state after they're not needed. Why do we need this? If there is damage to a neuron, or whatever caused that damage, and we'll talk about that in depth in a minute. But if there's damage to a neuron, the job of the microglia is to move into that area and clean it out. All right, these are the guys who do the demolition. They come in, you want to renovate a building, the microglia are the guys who come in, do the demolition, set it up for the new material to be able to come back in. They then, after they do their demolition, 
are supposed to call in the subcontractors to come and put the drywall up and the plumbing up and everything else that's supposed to go in place. And then they're supposed to go away. In a chronic inflammatory state, they don't go away. They stay in the demolition phase. And that's why we see ongoing neurodegradation and we see atrophy starting to occur as the brain shrinks because we see long-term destruction of neuronal tissue. So what happens is microglia can get activated in a number of different ways. And basically they fall into the category of DAMPs and PAMPs. Damage associated, associated molecular patterns and pathogen associated molecular patterns. And so you have neuronal death and that releases DAMPs, damage associated molecular patterns. And you get all these factors that come out of the cell. The microglia have receptors on their surface that allows them to pick up that this is happening. Then the end result is they move into the microgliosis phase and start creating the inflammatory process. The same thing happens if you have an antigen, if you have uh, problems coming from infectious disease processes, viruses, and whatnot. So what are DAMPs and PAMPs? So molecules present, so pathogen-associated molecular patterns are molecules present in diverse organisms, but not in us, okay? So viruses and Lyme disease and other bacterial infections can all create the problem. They provide exogenous signals that alert the immune system to the presence of pathogens, thereby promoting immunity, all right? We need cells in our body that can tell when things have entered us that do not belong there. That's what the innate immune system does, all right? Microglia, the innate immune system, and the central nervous system. Examples of pathogen-associated molecular patterns, these are actually etiologies, rather, of uh, pathogen-associated patterns, is all kinds of things. Strep infections, okay? Strep can induce an antibody infection, which we now refer to as PANDAS, pediatric autoimmune nervous system disorder, okay, from strep, all right? Produces bizarre behavior on the part of the kids, lots of OCD-type behavior, uh, as, long, as well as rage-type behaviors, and all kinds of pain problems that can go along with it. All right, PANS, which is the overview of that, not specific to strep, we now know can be created by Lyme disease, we now know can be created by Epstein-Barr virus, we now know can be created by mycoplasma pneumoniae, among others. So these infections get into the central nervous system and can do a great deal of damage. This is the process that they do it by releasing these factors and the things the types of PAMPs that we see are lipopolysaccharides, endotoxins, flagellin, think in terms of the spirochetes, um, and double-stranded RNA that you're seeing from viruses. So these things are released. There's receptors to these things on the microglia, and that puts them in through a microgliosis pattern. Damage-associated molecular patterns occur when cells die before they're supposed to. There's a normal process of cell death that occurs on an ongoing basis because we're constantly turning over cells in our body. If cells die before they're supposed to, because they've been damaged from any of a number of different conditions, that sends out information to the immune system that says we have a problem and we need to go clean this up again, okay? So it initiates, perpetuates immunity in response to trauma, ischemia, loss of blood supply to the area, cancer, other settings in which tissue damage in the absence of overt pathogenic infections, okay? So this is happening because not a bacteria or a virus has come into the system, but because cells are dying for some other reason. And we need both these things, right? Because not all damage in the body occurs because of infections. Sometimes it comes because of trauma. Sometimes it comes because of loss of oxygen or blood supply to the region. So these are two ways in which the microglia, the innate immune system, upregulate in order to start limiting the damage. Uh, other examples of damp, specifically these are things that are coming out of the inside of the cell, out of the mitochondria that are now outside. And as such, the, they're available to the receptors and they turn on uh, the microglia. So as we saw in the other picture, ATP, uh, uric acid, heparin, these are things which will turn on microglia. What, what are the origins of them? Concussions, right? Brain damage. Emotional stress. We now know through multiple studies that long-term stress causes neuronal death. It damages the brain. We know that bullying well, can be stressful enough to actually damage the brain and cause the inflammatory process to be set. Hypoxia, loss of oxygen to the brain. When does that occur? Well, in 5% of the population, it occurs every time they go to sleep. Sleep apnea. 
85% of people who have sleep apnea do not know they have it. So some people are literally killing themselves every night they go to bed. Environmental toxins. We see these in terms of pesticides and herbicides uh, in the environment along with heavy metals such as lead and mercury. All right, getting a picture here, if we're going to talk about neuroinflammatory disease, we have to think of it as a systemic illness. Chronic pain is a symptom of inflammation in the central nervous system. The causes of inflammation in the central nervous system are infections, concussions, emotional stress, environmental toxins, mold toxins, and autoimmune diseases, and there are more. But we have to think about chronic pain differently. Chronic pain is the symptom. And as long as we think about it as the symptom, and we know that the process going on is neuroinflammation, we now have a whole different set of questions to ask, and it requires that we get a very comprehensive history. It's not about what hurts, it's about the person that hurts. It's about understanding how that individual got in front of me at that moment, and what are the, what are the things that brought them there. And when we start asking those questions, we get a lot of very interesting answers. I can give you one example. I'll go back for a sec. I had a young man brought to me who had uh, severe depressive disorder. He had attempted to hang himself at one point. He had been uh, hospitalized on multiple occasions, unresponsive to any of the antidepressant medications. We worked him up as a neuroinflammatory disease. He had celiac disease. 15% of people with celiac disease will present without gastrointestinal complaints, but neurologic symptoms. We treated the celiac disease. We helped heal his gut. 100% resolution of the depression, 100% off antidepressant medications. He wasn't depressed. He had a neuroinflammatory disease manifesting as depression, the cause of which was celiac disease. Got to get this through our heads. We're treating the smoke, we're not treating the fire, and that's why we're failing. So what happens is we have damps and pamps that set off the microgliosis. The end result is we start producing all of these inflammatory factors that come out of the cells. What are the things, again, that set off the neuroimmune reaction? Physical trauma, ischemia, loss of blood supply, stroke. Obesity can be a factor. Not everyone who's obese has this problem. But there's a subset of people who have obesity also have significant inflammation going on in their body. Psychological trauma, autoimmune diseases, toxins, infections, and medications, opioids. The number one drug we use to treat chronic pain is probably creating more problems for us than solving. So all of these things can set off the microglia. And what, do you, what results is all of these inflammatory factors. And what results is all of these symptoms. Depression, anxiety, fatigue and malaise, sleep disorders, endocrine dysfunctions, pain, gastrointestinal problems. You can have fevers that come and go, and we can also see postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. These are the symptoms of inflammation in the brain. And then we need to go back and look at the causes of things that set off the inflammation. As long as we treat down here, we fail. We know that because we've been failing for a long time. We have to change the paradigm. We have to change what we're doing in order to get better results. The other thing we know about microglia, and this is why it's so crucial to understand the neuroanatomy, is that they possess memory. And repetitive stimulation leads to a chronic inflammatory state in the central nervous system. So in some people, and certainly genes direct this to a certain extent, but in some individuals, one hit from whatever the problem is will set off the microglia and they will not reset. But in most people, it's a series of things that have set off the microglia. And it's a series of things that then result in the damage. So you've got to look at it from a multi-factorial issue as opposed to the thing that created the problem. So these guys, once they're upregulated, can stay upregulated. It depends on the age of the individual. We also know that as we age, they move into the inflammatory phenotype by themselves. So 40 and 50 year old microglia tend to stay upregulated into an inflammatory state all by themselves with little coaxing. 
So it's much easier to fix the problem when you're younger than it is when you're older. This may also give us some insight into aging brains and ways that we can slow that process down and reverse it. Astrocytes. Astrocytes is clearly another major player in this. Astrocytes have a lot of work to do. They support the blood-brain barrier and modulate blood flow into the brain. That blood-brain barrier is what helps make the brain an immunologically privileged organ. Not quite as privileged as we once thought because now we know that it's connected uh, via the lymphatic system into the lymphatic system and the rest of the body, but still it helps protect the brain from normal things floating around in the blood that aren't allowed to get into it. It provides structural support in the brain, it modulates synaptic transmission, it modulates microglial activity. Its role in spinal and central sensitization, its role in uh, nervous system repair and glial scar. The glial scar is an interesting concept that's just evolving out. When neuronal damage has occurred, the microglia or the astrocytes rather seem to pave over that area. But unlike a scar on the skin, which is inert, those scars still seem to be active, but not normally active. And so we'll have to wait for further understanding in terms of what glial scars truly mean and what it is we're going to be able to do about them. What happens in a normal time period then is that you end up with death of a neuron for whatever reason. It releases, um, sorry, it releases factors which turn on the microglia and the microglia upregulate. The microglia then release a whole bunch of substances including reactive oxygen species and nitrogen species, the end result causing more damage to neurons. But it also sets off a bunch of factors that turn on the astrocytes. So the astrocytes also, when upregulated, start turning on microglia more, as well as doing further damage to the neurons. So there's this vicious feed-forward feedback process going on, and the astrocytes are key to part of this. What we don't know, and to step back for one second, we don't know is much past this. We're not sure how to go after the astrocytes specifically. We're just beginning to understand that. But unquestionably, their role is important here. And we're going to have to understand that most of the research has been focused on microglia to date. 